and turn for just a few minutes to, uh, well, let's see, where was I going to start? Ephesians chapter 1. Last week we started a lesson and we didn't get done with it, so I thought I'd try to finish it up today if I could. But it was the issue of uh, the truth must be rightly divided uh, for us to even have our salvation. And then salvation has to be rightly divided to understand what salvation you're talking about. So in Ephesians chapter 1, there's a verse that says this, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, ye members plural, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for the good news of what he's done for us. That message you gave to the Apostle Paul for the church today, the body of Christ. That we have salvation today by grace plus nothing. Thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for the great sacrifice that your son made on that cross for us. All that he suffered, all that he went through, for us. What great love that is. Thank you, Lord. We pray this morning as the word goes out that you will bless it. The Holy Spirit will take it, use it for your honor and your glory, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 we read this last week, talking about the good news of what, what Paul says, the gospel of your salvation. And when he says your salvation, who is he talking to? He's talking to the church, the body of Christ. And there is a salvation associated with the church, the body of Christ, that's different than the kingdom salvation. Salvation in the kingdom was to get into the kingdom and get the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. It's all about the Abrahamic covenant from Genesis all the way through. But the nation of Israel was to be that source of blessing, but they did not. They did not believe. They didn't continue to be faithful. And so God sent Paul, gave him the message revealed to us today, that God today was not saving men through the nation of Israel, but he was saving them through the Lord Jesus Christ and the message of God's grace, the gospel of the grace of God. Now, if we want salvation today, folks, it's going to have to be there. It's different and it's unique. It goes on in that chapter there of, of, of Ephesians 1 and verse 18. And he says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye, plural again, ye, the body of Christ, may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. According to the working of his mighty power. Verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ. That word wrought means worked. Which he worked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principalities and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named. Not only in this world but also in that which is to come. God has a special blessing for you and I today. We're seated today, positionally, in the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavens right now. Now, most people think, well, that's only a position for you when you die. No, we're there right now. And so in Ephesians, Paul goes on there in chapter 2 and, and verse 11, and he tells us to remember that things were a little different in time past. They can not always say that. The Gentiles now have got a new position, and it's in the body of Christ, not in Israel. They're not a proselyte. 
Wherefore, he says, verse 11 and 12, look at these two verses are the uh, backbone and the background for this chart up here. So I want you to look at those verses. Wherefore, remember, Paul says, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, 11 and 12, Paul says, remember, Gentiles, remember who you were in time past. Who were you in time past? You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. God had a covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. You were strangers to that. Yeah, you could come in by being a proselyte and become part of the nation, but you were not really a true Israelite. So in time past, you were in a separate position than the nation of Israel was with the Lord. And then he says in verse 12, and notice especially at that time ye were without Christ. Now we talked about that last week a little bit, but notice what does that mean ye were without Christ? When Jesus Christ come to the earth and started his ministry, who did he go to? Who did he go to? Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He did not go to the Gentiles. So when he says there that at that time ye were without Christ. In time past back there, you had no access to Christ because Christ didn't come to you. He only came to the nation of Israel. So during his earthly ministry, his message was always to Israel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and, and carrying on with that, he could not go to that Gentile until the nation of Israel had received the kingdom. In the kingdom, the nation of Israel will be that channel of blessing to all the Gentiles. That's what the nation of Israel was to be, and they failed sadly. They were God's ambassadors, God's go-between, they were the ones that were to see that these Gentiles over here had access to the kingdom. But they did not do that. Salvation then, how does it come to that Gentile? How does it come to that Gentile? In Ephesians 2, he tells us how it takes place. What it is, it transpires, it gets you into the church today, the body of Christ. And here you are in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Paul says, but now. And always remember that when you're reading something, the other and he says, but now. He's telling you something is like this. But now is like that. There's a change. So he says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Gentiles, you were far off. You were without Christ. But now you have access to what? For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle of all our petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. Our salvation today to eternal life comes because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He did something in there. He removed that law. He removed that enmity between the nation of Israel and all the Gentiles out there. And he placed them all on the same equal ground. As the song says, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The cross leveled everything up and put every man on the same level. So salvation in the day comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. But salvation is looked at so many times in the Bible in verses 
And it's not talking about salvation to eternal life, but it's talking about salvation to something else. I hope you know what it is because if you don't, you're liable to fall into the trap. Come over to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's just like when people read the Bible and they read baptism, they always just say water. But it's not always water. When you read salvation, it's not always salvation to eternal life. Salvation means to be delivered from something, freed up from some condition or the hope of somebody. And so when he talks about it, Paul talks about it. Pardon me. What salvation is he talking about? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Paul says, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's start in verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, what salvation is, is Paul talking about there? He's writing this, addressing it to young Timothy. It's a pastoral epistle, but he's addressing this to young Timothy. And he says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What, what salvation is he talking about there? What salvation is he talking about there? Is he talking about salvation to eternal life or is he talking about salvation from apostasy look at verse 16 and 17 and these are two powerful verses of scripture that you need to know in verse 16 all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god is a man of god a saved person or a lost person He's a saved person, is he? The man of God, he's a saved person. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we're talking about a saved person here that needs to stay in the scriptures, that needs to understand what the truth is and to miss the, the, the apostasy that's coming and, and the, the truth that's not being told. And so, if you want to serve the Lord today, you've got to stay faithful to the absolute truth, rightly dividing the word of scriptures. When it's talking about salvation, ask yourself, is he talking about salvation to eternal life? Or is he talking about you as a Christian being saved from apostasy and from the works of Satan? So many times, that's what Paul is talking about. Remember this, and... Uh, I know if any of you ever listened to Les Feldick, he, he says this over and over and over. Remember, Apostle Paul only wrote to save people, and that's true. Paul's message is to save people. And so many people take these verses of Scripture, though, and they turn around and they read them to be to the unsaved, but they're not. The truth will equip you as a saved person to do what's right and to be acceptable of God. There's two passages of scripture that are very important. I want you to look at them. I want you to come back to the book of John. The book of John, chapter 4. Something that Jesus said to his disciples a long time ago, but it's just as true today as it was then. John John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Well, again, I'll tell you what. Let's back up to get the context there. Uh, verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, 
Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. Ye know, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the Lord told us while we're way back there, you know, the, the, the time is coming when God will only accept wor worship in the spirit and in the truth. That tells me this. When people go around Saturday, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what your denomination is or what you believe. As long as you're faithful to what you believe, that's, that's a bunch of baloney, ain't it? We can only worship the God in spirit and truth. And he's provided that for us, so we have no excuse. Romans chapter 8 is another verse where people think to mean something entirely different about, about the, the, the truth of worshiping the Lord and, and how you carry on. Because they say that this is talking about your salvation from your sins. And folks, it's not. Romans chapter 8 in the verses 1 through 5. Passage of Scripture that's very familiar with it, but most people take it completely out of context. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit." Now, the first thing that you do is to come back up to verse 1 and you say, well, you know, the last phrase there is not supposed to be there. Because they take this verse to talking, be talking about eternal life, your salvation. So it should just read like this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The last part of that, they say, is not supposed to be there. Why not? Well, if this verse of Scripture or passage of Scripture was talking about your salvation, you could lose it. If you walk in the flesh instead of the Spirit, you could lose it. You come on down through there to verse 7, and it says, verse 6 and 7, for to be carnally minded is what? Death. So if you walk in the flesh, lose your salvation. But this verse of Scripture is not talking about your eternal life. It is talking about your Salvation from apostasy. Getting yourself away from the law system and everything back under the old program and get it under God's grace. And when you get yourself under God's grace, you're walking in the Spirit. You will be guided by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus because that's made you free from the law of sin and death. Wonderful thing to think about. We are completely free from the law. You can't break one part of that law out there and have God whip you. He doesn't do that. Our salvation from sin is one thing. Our salvation from apostasy is another thing, and that's the thing that you and I should be concerned about because when we live our life here, we're not supposed to mix the two. We're not supposed to mix law and, and grace. In Galatians chapter, not Galatians. Uh, yeah, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Notice what Paul said to these Galatians. This is one of his earlier epistles. He established his church and then he leaves and go on uh, his journey. 
And then he hears about them being overpowered by the Judaizers from Jerusalem and telling them that they can't be saved by Paul's gospel. They can't just be saved by grace and go on. No. But notice what Paul says there. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now notice, which is not another, but there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Change it. They come along and they change the gospel of Christ that Paul taught them. But he says in verses 8 and 9 something very crucial. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. How is important, how important it is for us today to stay true to this gospel. The gospel of our salvation. We are delivered from sin. We are delivered from uh, apostasy. But if we go back and put ourselves under that old law system and everything, we lose the blessings. Don't lose our salvation, but you're dead to the blessings that you could have. God expects you and I, when we get saved today, to let his son live in us. Does he have a right to? Absolutely. He sent his son to die on that cross, and he says he paid for all your sins. Now, can't you serve me? And he gives us the whole Bible, Romans to Philemon, to tell us how to do that. He expects us. He expects us to live for him and to serve him, and he has a right to. Philippians chapter 2, he says it like this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Paul says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but... How now much more in my absence? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye, ye shine as lights in the world." holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain. He expects us, Paul does, to stay true to that word that we might be blameless and harmless. We might be the sons of God. We're living in a crooked and perverse generation, yes, but we don't have to give in to it. God has made a provision for us to have everything. One more passage of scripture if I can if I can get there. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 32 and 33. Romans chapter 8 32 and 33. He that's God he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. It is God that declared you right. It is God that gave you a salvation that says you are free. Free, totally free. What you need to do is just believe what he told you. In closing, turn to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter two. First Thessalonians chapter two. Oh, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. One of Paul's first writings, he said this to that group of people there that he had formed in Thessalonica, and they were very faithful. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because... When ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Remember that. The word of God will work in you if you believe. The secret is to read it, commit it to your so let it live in you, and it will live out of you. But you have to believe it. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning for the opportunity that we have to open up your word. We thank you for these folks that are faithful to come and be with us. We pray the Holy Spirit will take the word this morning that is powerful, that it may go forth and it may do the work that you intend it for it to do because we know that it will. Even though the servant is weak, the word is powerful. The spirit is powerful and it can accomplish what the Lord wants it to. Thank you again for all these folks that are faithful to come and be with us today. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise for we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And for his sake we pray. Amen.